New information has come to us about Outlaws of Thunder Junction and its former epilogue set, The Big Score, which is now just part of the main set. So I've been covering this saga on the channel, and uh, I'd like to go over some updates um, and some clarifications. So uh, if you want to read some of the upper part of this article, uh, you can just pause here. I'm more interested in this section about The Big Score. So, we knew that there were 30 mythic rares in the big score. We knew we could find them on the list, but now we know that the entire list is 40 cards. 10 are special guests, and 30 are from the big score. So I was under the impression that the big score was 40 cards. That is not the case. Um, the big score is just 30 cards. Um, that leads me to think that they chopped down the epilogue set even more than I originally thought. You know, if it if it was originally 50 cards or 75 cards, it got chopped all the way to 30. As for the chance to find a big score card, we know that you can find a card from the list in 1 out of 5 play boosters. It's a 20% chance. And the list includes both of these. And then it says you'll find a non-foil special guest card in one out of 64 play boosters. Let's do a little bit of math. One divided by 64 is this chance right here. So a 1.56% chance they'll get a special guest card in any given play booster. So what does that leave for the big score? So we will take our 20% chance here. We will subtract the other chance, 0 And this is the percent chance that we're going to see a big scorecard in any given booster pack from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Play booster. No idea when it comes to the collector booster. There's a couple of different slots in the collector booster that have a chance, and they haven't said anything about the percentages, really. Um, not enough that I'm able to determine <laughs> what the odds are there. So... Uh, we can extrapolate from this number a couple of things. So if we multiply this by 5.5, you'll see that um, out of every 5.5 play boosters, you're going to average just a little better than one of these big scorecards. So, you know, roughly one every 5.5 uh, play boosters, slightly better than that chance. If you bought a play booster box with 36 booster packs, you are averaging between 6 to 7 uh, big score cards on average, uh, with a slight tendency towards 7, right? Better than 6.5. Now, uh, in a draft booster, which, you know, I don't have the updated numbers for play boosters, but let's assume they're the same for the moment. In a draft booster, the odds of getting a Mythic Rare is about 1 in 7.4 uh, booster packs. So, the odds of getting a big score card are better than getting one of the normal Mythic Rares, probably. Um, but the odds of getting a particular Mythic Rare is um, about the same, right? You're more likely to see more big score cards in general, but there are 30 of them compared to 20 Mythic Rares in the main set. So even though you'll have more big score cards, it's about as hard to collect them individually if you're looking for a particular card. It's roughly about as hard to find an, a particular one opening a pack as it is for the normal Mythics. 
So, what the heck are the big score cards? Well, they've got this vault door symbol on them. Um, we've seen uh, several artifacts, but now they've introduced a green card and a white card. The white card is Ultic Matterweaver. Uh, they said that uh, one of the themes is uh, token artifacts. So in green, this is Vault Born Tyrant. Um, which I'm looking forward to trying out in Constructed. Um, gaining life and drawing cards, frankly, it's one of the ways that you can just outvalue the opponent and power through whatever it is they're trying to do. You gain enough life, and that gives you enough tempo that you're able to get all your giant threats down. Drawing cards offsets the board sweepers. So, if you're doing those things, you're probably winning the game. And we've got uh, several artifacts. There's the Nexus of Becoming. And this one does make a token artifact. Actually, the green card does too, and it dies. The Sword of Wealth and Power, which, uh, I guess it's on theme. It makes a treasure token. Torpor Orb is a reprint. Um, so this is part of a uh, prison-style deck where you're just trying to shut off what the opponent's doing. So being able to get rid of the Torpor Orb uh, might be important for your deck if you need a lot of ETB triggers from creatures. Transmutation Font. This one seems a little bit more casual to me, but it does produce a lot of value. Um, and left uncontested, you know, this could start pulling out like portals to Phyrexia out of your deck and stuff. So I, I don't know that the opponent can ignore it once it's up to the point that you can sack three different artifact tokens. And you could have set that up, you know, before you cast this card. So the next turn when you've got the mana, or even, you know, if you had eight mana, and you had the artifacts laying around, you could do it. So this is the weekly MTG Outlaws of Thunder Junction debut after show. Uh, you can tell they're serious because they've brought out uh, the old bald white guys. <laughs> I'm joking, I kid, I kid. I'm an old white guy myself now, I'm like 40. Anyway, <laughs> but they say uh, some interesting things about the set that I'd uh, like to take note of here and discuss a bit. Like, right, it's the Fomori had left all these, like, you know, hopefully, like, really powerful things here, and, like, what, you know, what does that mean, and what could be in it, and, like, right, like, we, we, we played a lot, a lot off the idea of, like, we're going to look at, like, iconic artifacts from magic's past and like you know maybe there are links there like you know may like did did some of these ideas originate from the fomori or kind of vice versa and mm -hmm. like it just got to play around in the space of like what you know what are some cool cards that we can call back to and then there you'll okay so the fomori we don't know a whole lot about the fomori but they've been uh part of the storyline with quintorius um from strixhaven so the Fomori are a race of giant folk. Uh, they have like the creature type giant. We've seen a couple on cards. Um, they have horns. Um, I believe they have claws on their hands. And apparently they used to have a empire that spanned across multiple planes. Um, Quintorius refers to it as the coin empire because of the coin symbol that he keeps finding that represents it. We'll see a lot of, like, not everything is an artifact, like, a lot of the cards were also meant to be, like, I mean, yeah, we, we you saw sort of the, at the end of the debut video, right, that, right, there, there's a little bit more going on, and some of the past scenes, like, some strings were being pulled by some forces maybe you didn't realize, and trying to revisit, like, right, well, we, you'll see some of the cards are, like, from some of the planes that we've been to recently, and mm -hmm. kind of revisiting maybe what had been going on in, in some of the past um, sets that we've done, so it's a kind of a mix of a mix of that and just really trying to pay off like what are these cool what's the cool stuff in the vault and there is some cool stuff in the vault some of the cards he said are from some of the recent sets and that sounds like some of those cards like maybe the uh the Oltec, the white card um can make uh gnomes or copies of uh artifact tokens when you cast creatures they uh 
they basically are saying that some of these cards didn't necessarily come out of the vault. They were just going to be part of the big score um, to pay off some of the uh, like mechanics and recent sets. Um, so in that regard, you know, it was going to be like some of the cards in um, Aftermath that were nods to uh, some old archetypes kicking around standard, like uh, the Vampire Lord. Gave them plus one, plus one, and had madness. Um, some of that kind of thing sounds like was going to be part of the big score as well. And some of that uh, is still making it in. So yesterday, the main story finished. Next week, in concert with the time where we're doing the previews for the big score, we will also have those epilogue stories on uh, dailymtg.com, so you'll be able to read a little bit about what happened. Oh, thank after. goodness. I have so many questions after yesterday. <laughs> yeah. There are... I have no idea what's you, going on. You and the rest of the internet. Um, I have no idea. Because of our, our <laughs> Because What's-His-Face came in and grabbed the thing and yeah, then did Ashiok, the thing. Right? And then the, the yeah. two of the, the other people did the other thing. Yep. And then there was the Blinky, and I have no idea. This Okay, good. Woo! All right, so yes. Those oh. So for people who love the story, uh, I believe it's two more episodes um, talking about what happens at the end of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. So uh, there's been some criticism leveled at the uh, story of the set, which um, I do like uh, a game to be uh, holistically good in all of the different aspects of it. If the cards are fun, at the end of the day, I'm going to play with the cards. But it would be nice if there was something that makes sense or is cohesive about the story of it as well. So... Um, I'm going to have fun with the set either way, but um, maybe the follow-up stories can make a little sense out of uh, what happened in the main story arc. I'm not going to try to explain that here. Uh, this is one of those not an artifact cards that you were talking about, Dave. Right, right, yeah. Here, yeah, here we're visit revisiting, yeah, some, yeah, a, a creature um, and, and a concept from, yeah, a, a recent set that we we were working on, um, right, that I will say, like, this, one, one of the themes that you'll see through the, the big score um, is, a, is a focus on artifact tokens. Uh, was there just, was there just a person in the vault? Was this person just you chilling? Gotta, you gotta read this. No, I, this, per, this person, I don't believe this person was chilling in the vault. Okay. <laughs> there was something was else chilling. There, 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 was, there was someone else chilling in the was, vault. The, the it is not unheard of for a live being to be. Does in. the vault have like restaurants and like sleeping Maybe. quarters? I don't, I don't Okay. Uh, next <laughs> like week. I said, next, we'll have next week. People okay. next um, of note, yeah. <laughs> so, uh,. I love uh, how cheeky he's being about, uh, you know, asking about the vault and if this uh, guy was living in it. Yeah, they're basically saying this is like a, an allusion to a recent set that's uh, maybe another on-theme card. I don't know if it's like specifically a payoff card. I guess maybe it could be for like a gnome deck or something, um, referencing Lost Chirons of Ixalan. But uh, they're saying that not every card in the big score literally came out of the vault. So uh, that's my update for you guys. Just kind of a quick update here. Um, what do you all think so far about uh, this, you know, big score epilogue set being uh, shoehorned into the main set here? They're going to be more common than the normal mythic rares. They're going to be more rare than the rares are, by far. Uh, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing? Do you like them? Do you hate them? Are you indifferent? Please sound off in the comments. Let me know. I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by this whole process of the epilogue sets, uh, their failings, and their reactions to them. So... I might end up trying to collect uh, this subset of cards, just because they're interesting to me. Anyway, um, you can like and subscribe, check out the other videos on my channel, um, helps me out a bunch, and until next time, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy.